Maybe this river. I, I just, well, yeah. Let me see how I can get it there. Okay, you guys are going to pass this. Is there any way that the Medicaid numbers could be programmed into the individual's device um, by a nurse or um, an administrative staff member? I know they're going to go to their homes, but if we could somehow program that Medicaid number into the device. You're talking about like a save feature when, you, when you're using the internet, you kind of go in and save your username and yeah. password type of thing. We don't have that functionality at this time. While each individual receive a device, they are not specific to any specific individual, which um, might provide some challenges around this issue, but definitely has some advantages if you have multiple individuals receiving services in a single home, you don't have to figure out which person's device you have. So um, this time that's not an option. Julie, I got a question. So right now we're not doing this and we're really taking care of a group, are we? Right now group visits are excluded. Right, okay. So, yes. And we had a question in the back as well. I understand that the employees are going to know their name and they're going to know their social security number without having it written down. But when you've got a lot of aides going in, they're going to have the name written down of that patient and associated with that Medicaid number. That to me looks like it could lead into fraudulent billing if you got in the wrong hands. If it should get lost, it's going to be the agency that the HIPAA compliance issues is against. Because somebody in that agency had to give them the name and the social security, I mean their Medicaid number, so they could keep this in. So I. But I believe if it should get lost, fall somewhere, whatever, that it's going to come back on the agency as a HIPAA issue. We certainly understand your concern. As I said, we've reviewed it with our legal staff and um, are comfortable with the approach at this time. If you, we, you can certainly send your inquiry in and we can have our attorneys respond to you directly. I understand that um, for the employees, you have to have their, an email address and then they're going to have a password. I'm not sure, is the Santrax ID number, what exactly, is that for the agency or is each employee going to have a, their own Santrax ID number? <coughs> each agency will have a Santrax ID number and it is used on the login screen. Each employee will also have a Santrax ID that they would use for a telephony call to identify the direct care worker who is providing services in this um, for purposes of telephony. When you go through training for EVV, at the conclusion of training or the next day, you will get an email that will provide access information to your welcome kit. That welcome kit will have the agency Santrax ID in it. Mm -hmm. When you cre enter workers or employees into your system, the worker's Santrax ID is automatically generated by the system. Your individuals will also have a client ID identified or assigned by Sandata and that too is used in telephony in those situations when a phone number is either not associated with an individual or is associated with multiple individuals. Yeah, my question is about the email. Uh, one, you said the user say username. But when you use that, that's where they send it the, the password for the device. Correct. So my question is, the aid, for example, or employee, they come and then they go. So can the company create the emails for uh, for those ages, because if you use their email, they might go with them, you know? So that's one, uh, there is another. So the agency does always have the ability to inactivate an employee so they could no longer log into a device using their login credentials for your agency. Um, 
The system will require that each worker have a unique email and it will not allow you to reuse emails over time. Yeah, I understand that, but can the companies create the emails for those employees? Uh, so in that way, uh, if the employee leaves, this still the username will be the same. The agency can assign the email? Yeah. Sure. Um, the agency can create an email that they give to the worker to use for their sign-in. If that's the agency's decision around the approach they want to take. If the agency wants, wants workers to use a personal email, that's also fine. Okay, thank you. We got one more question up here and then we'll move on. Um, less of a question, more of a follow-up. Um, in terms of the, the issue with respect to losing or misuse of Medicaid numbers, um, you indicated, I thought I heard you just at the tail end of that say something you might provide us with that legal I said that guidance. if somebody sent a, an inquiry into the EVV mailbox, that would be the type of inquiry we would forward to our legal staff to help us respond to. Oh, okay, so you, you indicated that you had legal guidance on We've this We've had issue. conversations with our legal staff. But you've not had a legal opinion on it. Um, I don't think we have anything written. That we don't have anything in writing as far as a legal opinion. However, they have not identified this as a HIPAA violation issue. If okay. that would have been, been the case, we would have pursued a different avenue. Okay, I, I guess just as, a, as an issue from, from the industry as a whole, obviously we don't want, one of us doesn't want to be the first one that it's actually tested on. So it, it, some type of guidance or some kind of protection for the industry would be really great if you guys could provide something like that. Because we are going to be providing our people with that information and they will lose it, they will change jobs, and it, it will be a problem. Yeah, I think if we could be provided with a rationale and kind of uh, an explanation of, of why that determination was made, that'd be really helpful. So maybe if it's not an all-out legal opinion, but just stating, you know, based on HIPAA, federal HIPAA law, you know, we, just some sort of rationale, I think that would put a lot of people at ease. But not, I think, obviously this is a situation where we've done a lot of work, uh, we've heard this issue, we've done a lot of work on our end to talk to folks in D.C. and there, there's a difference in opinion, which uh, I appreciate, but when we're talking about legality, we're talking about Medicaid billing, you know, those types of things, I think it would be, go a long way to have something we can share with folks. Yeah, yeah. we would well, like for you to submit that question to our EBV mailbox, and that way it's an official submission and we can respond accordingly. Mm -hmm. okay. And that way it's a standard consistent response that everyone has access to see. The other thing that Joe. would be helpful, Joe, yes. I think is if you could give us um, any documentation you've received from right. the people who have different opinions, because that would without a doubt help our attorneys. Right. Sure in their analysis? Joe, I think this is important enough that I would ask the Ohio Council to formally ask the Ohio Department of Medicaid for a written opinion. Okay. Because this gentleman is right. One of us is going to become the scapegoat. One of us is going to get in trouble with either the federal government or the public consulting group or somebody over our interpretation from our own legal counsel perhaps, but what, from what we hear in this meeting with regard to what the outcome is. And I don't think there's a single person in this room who does not believe this is a concern. Because we work with people every day, we understand what happens, we understand the turnover in our industry. So I would ask as a dues paying member of the Ohio Council that you formally make a request. Absolutely, we'll do that. And um, again, we've talked to, to HIPAA attorneys in DC and uh, we've come to the determination of that we are not going to be assuming any responsibility for um, anyone who is, um, unless there is clear willful HIPAA acts on their end um, when it comes to, I mean, it's just clear documentation that this is, and we've had a lot of conversations, this has been sort of the, uh, the, the information shared to us from the department. Uh, we have a, a lot of supporting documents to, to, to show that um, 
if we're put in a compromising position that leads to a HIPAA, we're going to be able to use that information. But uh, we certainly will dig a little bit deeper on this and see what we can come up with. All right, let's um, move on to the next. Uh, actually, so the next issue we kind of covered <coughs> regulatory compliance, uh, dealing with the alternative EVV um, specs that can change. But um, uh, is there anything the department would like to say on how can agencies ensure that they receive updates on changes to the alternative EVV specs in order to remain compliant? If, in fact, we were making a change, I would um, anticipate us contacting providers currently using alternate systems. The current specifications will always be maintained on our website. And for this and all matters related to our EVV implementation, I encourage providers to check the EVV page on the department's website frequently because if we do um, publish an update, we'll certainly put it there. We also have sent lots of emails to providers about EVV over the last year. Um, please make sure your email in MITS is current because we get a surprising number of bounce backs, which means people just don't get our emails, whether it's to say you have to go to training or you have to, um, or please order your devices or EVV is coming. Um, and it's a concern because that's how we're sending out information. So please make sure your agency email is current and make and share that information with people so that we can reach as many people as possible. Um, Jim, if we could go to the next slide. Uh, we're gonna open it up. If you've got questions on the regulatory compliance piece, uh, uh, feel free to, to ask it at this time. But um, no, the, the one before that, please. Oh, looks like we're, well, we'll just, oh, we'll open it up at, at this time for, um, for questions, whether it's the regulatory compliance or any other additional topics. Thank you. I was just going to add to the request that the Ohio Council do a formal, I guess, opinion or work with uh, the Department of Medicaid that we take a look at the SAN Data Business Associates Agreement to potentially specify all the data elements that are being required to be provided and transmitted so that there would be some coverage for the providers that are agreeing to participate. Um, and then it's covered under that business associates agreement, which I'm assuming San Data and each provider agency is having to take care of. I mean, I, I think the other thing as providers, the reality is that I'm with you all. I completely agree. I'm one of the, those large providers that feels like they're all alone and continuing to provide services to Medicaid beneficiaries. But I guess the other reality of it is, is we provide a lot of information and data to our employees today. And so I think we do need to ask for these things to be legally reviewed and then simultaneously, I think the reality is is we have a lot of information that flows regardless of EBV or not. And so I think that we have to make sure we're striking a balance, but it would be helpful to make sure that we have business associates agreement coverage that specifies out transmitting employee, because I mean, we're opening the door because we don't give employee social security numbers to anybody. Right. <clears throat> so, we're opening a door there, and I think that that's a significant issue so that if, I mean, it could come from any front. It could come from unionization efforts. It could come from anything that you could fathom. And so I think that we need to just make sure that we're covered on all potential basis fronts. And then I think it also is probably appropriate to make sure that either, I guess, Medicaid provide clear documentation to organizations so that they can take the human resource departments to say why I need employee social security number information because it's not something that most organizations are giving to various levels of the organization to do registrations. Thank you, and we'll do that. Just again, in addition on that, since we're both on that topic, I mean, most recently for those of us that have a terminal distributor license for pharmacy, the Board of Pharmacy uh, told us to omit the social security numbers from our nurse license list that is uh, that we submit every year. And they felt that it was, you know, a security risk, um, a risk on many, <coughs> on many fronts. So the fact that 
another organization within the state of Ohio has felt that it is inappropriate to have social security numbers floating around, I think is another reason not to only ask from a patient standpoint for HIPAA, but also from our workers. Sure. And this is a, a concern that we've raised. Um, uh, we, before I was with the council, there was even a letter sent from the council to the department about the, <coughs> uh, the need to avoid any type of registry, that type of thing, and so certainly social security numbers fall into that conversation. So. This has been on uh, our radar screen, and we've shared these concerns with the department. But um, we will um, we will uh, take your um, direction, and we will we'll dig down on this and, and get some more information for you. I just want to add a point of clarification. Well, we will collect these numbers. We would never share them with anybody. Does they aren't they are protected from any public information requests? They'd be redacted, so it would not be ever information that could be used to help establish a registry or that the department would produce. I would also like to make sure you all know that Sandata is actually obligated to meet all the same requirements for HIPAA, personal identifiable information, tax identifiable, inf identifiable information, and just the use of information that govern Medicaid. That includes both federal and state requirements. And finally, while that information will be in the system, only a very small number of people at the state level will have access to the social security number information and only when it's necessary to support their job function, such as doing program integrity analysis. All right, this is on a, a slightly different note regarding um, billing codes and giving them to my home health aides. Uh, as I'm sure you can imagine, it's going to be very difficult to get them to understand this is a billing code, you have to put it in. So when we get to phase two and phase three, if I have an employee right now that's working a split shift, half Medicaid, half passport, what can we do to make it so that they can actually comprehend the first hour you clock in with your T code, the second hour you clock in with the G code, um, for instance, and get that to run smoothly. Uh, because what I foresee happening is they're not going to remember right on the hour. They say they remember an hour and 10 minutes in. Then somebody at my staff back office has to go in, manually enter it, also have written documentation for why we're changing it. And that just seems so overwhelming when at the end of the day, the aide could just clock in at the beginning, clock out at the end, and you guys could understand it's a split shift because of how we build. <laughs> so um, obviously, we recognize it's a training issue for agency providers. We, you have to remember that it's an automated system. And as we work out the details of how we are going to use this information, in claims adjudication, a visit is going to need to match some way, somehow, and I don't know how yet, we're still working on it, um, a claim or a line on a claim. So each line will have to have a unique visit record in EVV. The, uh, as you noted, you have, you have some choices. You could have the worker clock in and out, and you could do the manual splitting of the visit to record the different codes in your office. You, if you, that's more practical for your particular agency than training the worker to use both codes. But this is sort. Of, this is really the reality of the electronic age. Ooh. <laughs> but we can't do that. So I really appreciate the point that he raised, and I think what we're trying to say is that neither option is very practical, either expecting the employee who's making $10 or so and less on average an hour to be able to monitor their time in this way when they have such a high amount of responsibility already. It's essentially like I'm considering as the uh, company administrator buying a a device that will set an alarm for them to be able to do this, which is another additional overhead kind of cost that we have to take on in order to make sure that we're maintaining compliance and able to even get paid the minimal amount that we, we are to receive for the services provided. 
Additionally, having the office staff take on that burden is going to be, depending on the volume of the clients that you have, a full-time job, I'm assuming. So I think perhaps a suggestion to fix the problem moving forward would be to allow the uh, caregivers, nurses, to select multiple billing codes. And if the total somehow in the aggregator, aggregator for what our billing claim is um, the submission that we make, it does not exceed what is on the service plan or what is allowed by the state, then that would be more reasonable than for someone who perhaps gets a one hour state plan shift in the morning, followed by two hours of homemaker passport, followed by another hour of passport personal care, and then another hour of state plan later on in the evening, which is, which is, is in existence mm -hmm. at this time. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. So it's, it's a near impossibility to expect these employees to be able to comply with this. And you can say that we can train our staff to do it, but they have difficulty maintaining compliance with the paper documentation, which seems like it should just be A, B, and C, and you're done. It's laughable to the amount of mistakes that we have to correct in one week mm -hmm. on paper, let alone to expect some of these aides who don't even have cell phones or an email address. So as the agency, we're going to have to be maintaining this email address and getting the password retrieval for them. I foresee this happening already. It, it, there has to be something better that we can do that is a blanket for this the entire time and not the individual components of the different payers. I appreciate any suggestions people have and I know that everyone on the team in the department all the way up to the director appreciate suggestions people have. We certainly encourage you to send those suggestions to the EVV mailbox and as we're working on requirements for phase two, we will consider those, talk to Sandata about them, and our um, MITS programmers about them, and determine what's um, practicable from an IT perspective. Uh, so suggestions are great because nobody can think of everything, so send them. I'm not saying we'll be able to incorporate any or all of them, but I can promise you we'll look at them all and talk about it with as we're developing requirements for subsequent phases. We have a, another question, but I did want to uh, plug the, the information here. Uh, this should be in your uh, PowerPoint in your packet, but uh, so the email address for questions, and this would be an area where we want to send emails to uh, questions and suggestions, evv at medicaid.ohio.gov. Um, and ODM is going to continue to uh, outreach efforts to providers uh, and deliver updates. We're, again, we're going to continue to engage. There's going to be 24-7 EVV support once the system um, goes live. And then there's going to be an, uh, access to an online um, LMS uh, learning management system for refresher training and also uh, training for new hires. Um, the Medicaid um, specific EVV page is listed here, although if you just Google ODM EVV, it pops up as the first one. Um, and then the provider hotline is listed, 1-855-805-3505. So those are the different options um, we, can, we can kind of engage. Yeah. If I go back to our colleague Ali said um, business associate agreement, I don't think any of us any have any business associate agreement with Sandata, so we assume ODM is taking that responsibility and as of the HIPAA because we are providing